Got a line at the door over there. All right, you guys. I know the vendors are fun, but that's not what you paid to come here for. That's just a benefit we offer. You know, our health is very important. And uh, it's the reason I bring these guys. Because I know what it's done for me. I know the sheer amount of hours I work, the amount of stress I'm under. I know how my health was declining. I know the things that were happening to me and my body. And because of the health technologies, I feel 10 years younger now than I did in 2013. I'm in good shape. I got a lot of endurance. And... I spent a lot of time behind a desk and behind computers and things that aren't really healthy for your body. And I've got a lot of, a lot of strength. And I'm 60 years old this year. Okay? And I feel like I'm 45, and a lot of it is this technology and what it's done to help heal my body. Where'd Amy just go? The, Amy? She's short. I can't hurt she going? Oh, she went outside? Okay, Amy just recently got here. She had some challenges to get here. And she just got here, and she has a frequency bed in a Mercedes van that's going to get plugged in, and people will be able to use it throughout the weekend until late in the, at night. She usually stays with people until midnight if she has to, to help you, okay? What's going on in that room over there? I bought one of those. There's a reason I bought one. It's because I'm on the road all the time, and I can take it with me. And it, it analyzes 1,700 parts of your body, and it will fix it. And uh, I've had a lot of trauma, a lot of body trauma. I've been in a lot. A lot of situations that some of you have heard some things about, some of you not. But my rotation on my shoulder used to be about like this. That's it. That's as high as I could lift it. Now I can go like this without any pain. I have virtually no pain anymore. I lived with pain for 26 years. So I know what this technology does. And I know how important it is to us, and that's why we bring it here. And we've got great doctors here. Um, Paul Willett, eating a sandwich still, probably because you were talking all through lunch, huh? Paul, in my personal opinion, is one of the most brilliant doctors in this country and has written a couple of books that are going to be published soon, and he could show you that at his table over there. Um, but the AMA, the hospital, the medical associations, the state medical boards have tried to destroy this man. And he he's incredible. And he knew when COVID started that it was all crap, to put it mildly. And He's awesome. Talk. Make sure you talk to him while you're here. Learn some stuff, guys. This is uh, this is great for us for our health. Okay, I'm going to hand the mic to Katarina, Katie, Katie, and uh, let her tell you about what she does. Hello. Can you hear me? And and, and Hi, tell I'm them a Katie. little about your story and about your beautiful children. And okay, so um. I met David Strait last year in March at my first David Strait seminar, and I introduced myself to him as the owner of the Telegram channel uh, called David Lester Strait, which I uh, took the liberty in creating once I found he didn't have a channel on Telegram, and I just wanted to get his videos out to the uh, public on social media, so I created that channel, and I uploaded every video I could find onto that channel, and by day three, he became a subscriber of the channel which is pretty cool. Um, when I met him at this seminar, which was three weeks later, 
I uh, introduced myself as the owner, I offered to give him the channel, and he told me that he was uh, too busy to operate social media, but that I was doing a good job and that I could continue uh, owning it, and so I made him an admin. A couple weeks after that, I, I made a video of uh, his wife, Bonnie, who did a presentation on Sunday at the seminar, and I made a seven-minute segment of her uh, speaking about the Sabbath, and I shared it on Telegram, and she, she was really happy about that video. When I met her two weeks later at the RT meeting in uh, King, Texas, we crossed paths in the parking lot, and she asked if I was the one who did the video, who made the video of her, and I told her yes, and she's, she was really excited, and she asked if we could exchange phone numbers um, so that I could make more videos for them. And I was excited to have her number, so we exchanged numbers. Two weeks after that, my daughter had a, my eight-year-old daughter had a seizure at school, and she has been having seizures since she was three years old. Um, so I've dealt with her seizures. I know there's nothing doctors can't do for her. Um, I denied medical transport from the school to um, the hospital because they wanted to send my daughter to the hospital, and I know there's nothing they could do. So I told them, no, she just needs to go home. Um, and I withdrew my daughter from school so I could homeschool her again um, because the public school just wasn't working out at that point. They had been treating her different because of her seizure disorder. So anyways, uh, a week after that, CPS came to my property demanding to speak with me. And um, I went open the gates and they texted me and I called immediately. I screenshot the text and I sent it to Bonnie asking her, what do I do? CPS is at the gate. And she told me not to talk to them um, and to give them her phone number and she'd be my counsel. So I did that. And C CPS and Bonnie talked for uh, a while and Bonnie learned that that CPS lady had just left the school and had taken a picture of my nine-year-old daughter without my permission. She went to the school and interviewed my nine-year-old daughter uh, behind my back. Bonnie was upset. I was upset. Um, so I went to the school. I withdrew my nine-year-old daughter. By the time I got to the school um, and got my daughter, I got back home. There was a sheriff at my gate. And I go in the gate. I called David and Bonnie, and uh, they told by that time, the sheriff had texted me and was wanting me to call him so he could work out this situation with CPS, and they would just go away. But Bonnie said, no, have him call me. I'll be your counsel. So Bonnie was on the phone with the sheriff when um, David called me and told me to leave, like, get my kids and leave the house right now because they didn't trust uh, what CPS and the sheriff was going to do. They could have came in with a fraudulent warrant or something and take, had, they could have taken my kids. So I uh, loaded up my kids in the car. I have four children. They're three, four, nine, and ten at this time. Um, that's how that was like a year ago. So now they they were a year younger then. But anyway, so we leave. Right, I drive past the gate. I mean, out of the gate, past the sheriff that was sitting there in his car or truck, and I was really nervous because my tags were expired on my car, and I had no insurance. And I just knew he was going to pull me over. And he threatened to. Like, Bonnie was on the phone with him the entire time. And he had told her that I just drove past him. And if he wanted to, he'd pull me over and take me to jail for having uh, inspired stickers. And she's like, no, you, you won't. That's not an arrestable offense. If you do, I will sue your ass in federal court. You leave her alone. <laughs> and he left me alone. And so, anyways, I went to David and Bonnie's. It was about a three-and-a-half-hour drive. While I was there, they provided safe housing for me and my four children. Um, CPS had an order from the courts to remove all four of my children and to go get uh, uh, evaluations on my children um, without me being there. And I wasn't there, so they couldn't take my children. Had I been there uh, with the court order, the cops probably would have forced their entry into the property and could have taken me to jail and taken my children, but I wasn't there, thankfully. So in total, I was with David and Bonnie in a safe housing, not at their house, but somewhere else in the area for six weeks. At one point, the court ordered me to show up to court with all four of my kids so that they could do a, a, an investigation. And if I didn't, I would face up to six months in jail. 
and I had not committed any crime. All I wanted to do was live in the private and not contract with a for-profit corporation such as, as uh, CPS. Bonnie helps prepare my paperwork, and I did not show up to court physically. I showed up to court with the paperwork she uh, helps me make. And on the cover sheet, it was uh, saying that I am appearing by special appearance, exclusively reserving all of my God-given rights, waiving none. And the paperwork was an affidavit of truth, challenging standing uh, and jurisdiction and demanding dismissal for lack of standing and jurisdiction. And CPS ordered the call. Uh, requested the judge to dismiss the case in the best interest of my children because her paperwork called them out on the fraud of how they create causes of, of actions against us for our CUSIPs and access to our children's trust. So anyways, my case got dismissed on Donald Trump's birthday on June 14th, 2022. <laughs> um, while I was there with him, that week, and they had a seminar in Keene. I could have gone home because my case was dismissed, but instead I stayed to attend the seminar, and I'm glad I did because I happened to be standing next to David at one point when somebody came up to him and had asked if, they, if David could help them with their paperwork, their AOR, the Affidavit of Repudiation, which is the first step in becoming an American state national. And David told, uh, Joey was his name, that he, he's like, I'm sorry, I'm too busy, but she could help you. And he was like, okay, I'll pay you. And from that day on, I've been doing AORs, helping people with their paperwork. To be I set her America's up in business. business right there and then. <laughs> gave her a room, a room off the main room that we were having the seminar. There was 364 people in the room. And I gave her a main room. And how many AORs did you do that weekend? Um, 19. It was really incredible, but I had so many uh, And it changed her life. Yes, because let me tell you, I, was a, I am a single mom, and uh, I have four children from one man, my ex-husband, and he doesn't help with anything financially. Um, and I have been making masks for two years, uh, netted masks, tool breathable masks to sustain us through the COVID pa pandemic. Uh, but in February of 2022, the mask mandates were lifted. Uh, that venture just went, took a plummet, like no money was coming in for that. And I really had no idea what to do. But I prayed to God that he, I knew God was going to take care of me and my children. Then I met David like the next month, which was March. And then by June, that really bad, scary situation with hiding with my kids, um, ditching my cell phone. For six weeks, I thought like for the rest of my children's a childhood we'd be living as fugitives because there was no way I was ever going to let the state get their hands on my kids uh, I would live as a hermit and I don't care my, my kids are mine you know that's my God-given property and I would die for them so I was willing to do that but God's turned it around into something so beautiful and now you know we're, we're doing really good I have uh, ASN clothing.com where I am providing state national gear, clothes, hats, flags, bumper stickers, as well as trademarks, paperwork, to help you become an American state national with AORhelp.com. So anyways, I'm really nervous. This is my first time telling my story <laughs> to a crowd of people, so. I am very thankful for David and Bonnie. I've seen them work tirelessly helping people. Um, they helped me and my kids. They didn't ask for a penny. They helped us for free. And um, after they s saved me and my kids, I shared my testimony on my channel on Telegram. My channel is General Flynn Exposed. It's uh, also called General Fully Exposed. But when I shared my testimony of how they helped me get my case shut down, a mother reached out saying that CPS had kidnapped her kids the day before, and she really wanted them back. And uh, I contacted the girl. CPS had kidnapped her uh, two-year-old and six-year-old during a traffic stop. When she wasn't even arrested, she was detained for questioning. And CPS came and took her kids out of Maine. And they threatened her with uh, losing her parental rights. They took her kids on July 4th, and on July 11th, they had a hearing for her custody. And uh, me and Bonnie worked on her paperwork over that weekend. July 11th was on a Monday. And uh, we had her paperwork done. By Sunday night, she went into the courtroom 
on uh, Monday at 8.30, and they wrestled this girl, intimidated her, didn't want to acknowledge her paperwork, kept trying to force her to accept a court-appointed attorney, um, kept trying to convince her that she'd have to accept social services family plan planning agreement in order to have access to her children. But she, stu she stood her ground. She refused to contract. She didn't even enter the bar of the court. Uh, she stayed out in the pews to argue her case. And the courts kept recessing. They didn't really know what to do with his mother who wasn't backing down. So every time they'd recess, she'd come outside the courtroom and call me, who, and I just happened to be with David and Bonnie. So she was getting one-on-one -on -one coaching this entire time. For four hours, they wrestled this girl in the courtroom. And she was at the point of like almost wanting, she was just exhausted. And, but we just kept and encouraging what happened? her. We kept encouraging her to just stand and fight. And her husband was wanting to just give up and accept the court appointed attorney. They intimidated him. They wore him out. He was scared. And I got him on so the phone. I and got him, him on the up. phone with David. I was like, David, will you please talk to this woman's husband? And he said, yes. So David took the phone in the room and I sat right next to him. He was on one chair. I was on another chair on the edge of my seat. And I, I, this, David told this guy, he said, I've been fighting cases, CPS cases like yours for over 30 years. I've seen over a thousand cases just like yours. I'm going to tell you what happens. If you go in there and do every single thing they tell you to do and jump through every hoop that they give you, there's a 90% chance you will not see your kids again. But if you do what I tell you to do, there's a 50% chance you will. And so he said, okay, okay. And he backed up and he let his wife handle it. Within an hour, she called me. It was 12.30 p.m. She called me that they had dismissed her case, and she was getting her kids back that day at 4 o'clock. And she did. She got her kids back that day at 4 o'clock. It was very incredible to see that their process does work. Sometimes it doesn't because every case is different, and every parent doesn't do the same thing, and they might contract unknowingly. So it's, it's just a very risky, sad business uh, with the child trafficking system that we have in America where they kidnap children from good parents. Um, anyways, it's really sad. The corruption in this country is, is bad, and it's time to be, it has to be changed because we cannot continue living this way. We can't raise our children to where they could just be kidnapped and taken. We, we have to fight for them. Anyways, I wanted to introduce to you this book. It's called The American Sovereign. It's how to live free from government regulation. It teaches a lot of stuff that David teaches in his seminars. It goes on a deeper dive uh, on how to talk during a traffic stop about the right to travel, how to stand in court, how to uh, put your business and yourself into a trust, uh, how to not have to pay taxes anymore, how to rescind your social security number, how to live free from government regulation. This book is really hard to get. You cannot buy it on the internet if you buy it from the publisher or the author, you have to get a uh, postal money order for $75, mail it to him, and then he'll mail you the book. So it's really hard to get, but I'm offering it to you for $80 at that table. And if you could get a book, this is one that you would really benefit really from. If you do get it, do not loan it out because you will not get it back. And I have civil peace flag shirts. I, I have a sale on my shirts right now. They're normally $25 each. If you buy three or more, they're $20. I just put all my uh, inventory online, and I want to go digital, so I want to get rid of my inventory. So. Okay, your time's up. up. Okay, bye. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for listening to me. Uh, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> what? Katie's like my daughter. Her children are now my grandkids and uh, part of the family, and uh, she's the best mom I've ever seen. She is attentive. She teaches her children at home, homeschools them. She works for me full time and then some. She's up half the night taking care of the Telegram channels, all the social media, handling all the orders, handling all the straight event stuff. I mean, I cannot tell you how much she does for me. And now that Bonnie is where she's at, she's taken over Bonnie's job too. And she is incredible. I couldn't do this without her, especially recently. And I wanted to let her know. <sighs> All right, now I'm done crying for a minute. Takes me a minute. 
I got Dave Wagner and his beautiful wife back there in the corner, and everybody's wondering, what do they do? <laughs> well, let me tell you something about them. I'd been talking in my seminars about how important it is to own your own property, that you can't be a king unless you own your own castle, that you've got to own some part of land, and you need to land patent it. And that having that land patented property helps you when you go obtain your SESTA QV trust. When you go in front of that federal probate judge to obtain your trust, it's really important that you have superior titles of ownership to prove you are the king. And it's hard to be the king without a throne. And you don't own your castle, it's pretty tough. Now, I also understand that a lot of people are coming from a lot of different backgrounds, and there's a lot of people who live in apartments, condominiums, homeowners associations, and so forth, that can't get a land patent on their property, or it's not... Homeowners associations, you can get a land patent on your property, but sometimes you piss off all your neighbors because you tend to do what you want to do, and the reason they formed a homeowners association is so they can tell you what to do. And so you end up getting in a little war. So it's very important to own, and most people can't afford their own land anymore. So I've been talking about buying property in Texas because Texas is unique. In all of the United States, it's the only state that when they rejoined the Union after the Civil War, they did not cede their, or it was actually before the Civil War, it was 1850, the offer of compromise. Anyway, is what it was called. Anyway, uh, they did not cede their land to the United States government. So in all the rest of the states, you go through the Bureau of Land Management to get a land patent, which used to be the General Land Office. But in Texas, you go through Texas to get a land patent. It's different. And so we wanted to buy properties in Texas and divide those properties with the permission of the counties. That was fun. Uh, in order to sell people a piece of land that they could afford and give them a grant deed on a land patented property. And so we bought property, carved it up into one cubic yard pieces, and we can sell you a cubic yard and you will have a grant deed on a piece of land. And people say, what, are, what can I do with a cubic yard? Well, nothing. You can go out there and visit it all the time if you want. <laughs> We're going to buy additional land, and eventually the land's going to get nicer and nicer and nicer until the point where we've got literally a, a large piece of property with a clubhouse, a place to hold meetings, an outdoor recreation center and RV spaces and you can take your RV and go park on a piece of land and if you buy one piece any piece that's part of the private membership association of land and you have a deed you can use any land that we buy in the future not cool so What's the price? 387 bucks. And you get nine square feet of Texas. And you can be a Texan or a Texian. Now, you know what the difference between a Texan and a Texian is? This is going to be fun for me right here. Because I was told wrong when I moved there. <laughs> I had to learn what the difference was. A Texan is a white Anglo-Saxon who lives in Texas. And a Texian is of Spanish or Native American descent. I did not know that. 
learn something new all the time. So anyway, go see them in the corner and buy your chunk of Texas. And it doesn't seem like much, but when you once you get that deed in your hand, use it. Put it in your file. Use it as a grant deed. You don't have to tell them how big a piece of property you own. That's the thing. If you did that, if you had to do that, they'd be regulating you. That pretty soon they might say, no, you got to own at least 10 acres of Texas or 100 acres of Texas or 1,000 acres of Texas to be a king. See, they can't do that. So it doesn't matter the size of the land. It matters that you are a land owner with a grant deed. Now, I know countries like Scotland and Germany, I can buy one square feet of Scotland and be a Scottish lord. Same with Germany, one square foot. And they charge several thousand dollars for that, and they give you a deed, and they give you your lordship. Well, who the hell wants that? This is more important. It's right here in America, and we've made it available to hundreds of thousands of people because we're buying enough land to divide it up into hundreds of thousands. And we're not making hardly any profit. This is, this is for a different purpose. The purpose is so you can be a king. And God says, I am the king of kings. He never said he's the king of slaves. And he, all through the Bible, he tried to lead the slaves out of captivity to freedom. And we're all supposed to be free. And he didn't create any borders. He never created borders. So that's a great opportunity. Um, really unlike anything else. No one else does that. No one else made the effort to go out there and buy property and invest money in property, get permission with the county, put it in land patent, divide it up to where we're getting the deeds. It's really an incredible thing. So you, if you go to the county and you tell them your property taxes are $800, let's just say. I'll just use a round figure, $800. But if you do it our way, and there is no property taxes, just your filing fees alone, you're going to make 227000 Are you willing to do that? And the county starts to think, oh, 227000 is much better for our county than $800 a year in property taxes. We can better fund government. And that's what that does. Okay. I don't see Marcella, so I'm going to pick on Tony for a minute. Stand up, Tony. MCO titles. There's been a breakup in his company for a while, but Tony started it. He took upon something that was one of our most difficult things to ever accomplish as a state national. Hey, don't go too far, Marcella. You're next. She doesn't know she's doing this. Um, but I can remember trying to get MCOs out of states, out of the DMVs, and it was almost impossible for state nationals to do it. State nationals in my group in Oregon, I only know two people that were successful in 20 years of getting an MCO out of the Department of Motor Vehicles of the state of Oregon. Two. Both of them worked over two years to get it, and I was one of them. And I spent a ton of time, a ton of letters back and forth, and I know what the process was to get those that MCO on my pickup. And it was next to impossible. 
It took a lot to learn enough to finally get one out of the state of Oregon. And I know people in other states who are having that same kind of issue. A year, two years, lots of money spent, still didn't get it. Many, many people failed. And then people with Tony, they complain sometimes if it takes a few months with no effort on their part. <laughs> He's doing all the work. But people want instant gratification nowadays, and it's not always possible. But just the fact that he can provide that service is incredible for most people, for us. People who have been around a long time knowing how hard they were to get. I told Tony, if it takes you a year to get it, they can wait. And they're better off than they used to be. But they don't understand that. So explain it better. And that's half the problem is communications. Communications is tough because we're dealing with so many people. You can only spend so much time on the phone a day. And when you're dealing, we, he had one guy order a thousand MCOs from him. One person. So people will go on Telegram channel and say, well, Tony never gets back to me. I see those comments all the time. Well, he can only call so many people. Because he's just one guy, and there's only so many hours in a day. And if he talks to each person 15 minutes, it burns up an eight, eight or 10 or 12 hour day pretty fast. So he can't even get to everybody. I know because I get about 10,000 emails a day. Not to mention phone calls, social media, text messages. Messenger messages, Facebook messages, Twitter messages, on and on and on. Everybody's trying to get a hold of me. I can't talk to you all. And it's very difficult. So I know very well. So sometimes you got to cut him a little slack. But he has to get better at business too. And he is. He's getting very good. So let him, give him a chance to improve. And he's built his business, and he's improved, and he's hired people, and he's got bigger space. All these things of, of business, you get, if you have to hire people to work for you, you've got to have a place for them to work. He's had to go do all that. See? So it's all those little business things that one guy is trying to accomplish to help thousands. So, Marcella, come here, honey. Come here. This beautiful lady and I have been through a lot together for a lot of years. Several, several years. I'm going to let you tell your story. And th just do it. You can do it. Just, uh, just make it short and sweet, simple. Come on, you can do it. They want to hear. Okay. All right, I'm not going to put her on. Hey, come talk about 7K, though. I don't want to put her on the spot with the... <laughs> hey, trust me. It was really hard to ever get her to talk in public quite a while ago. She's one of the smartest people I know. She's got a brain that won't quit. She won't tell you, but I will. Okay. I know, I saw it. I get in trouble. She's like my daughter. I love her to death. I've uh, I had to haul her around for a while, protect her. She was literally being hunted, and her kids were taken by courts. And uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to say too much. I promise. But anyway, many many people were asking me because I talk about how important gold and silver was and how it's real money. 
and not the fake currency that we all are used to and how everybody should be putting something to invest into gold and silver. And people were always coming up at me, David, where do I buy it? Where do I buy gold and silver? Where do I buy gold and silver? So she found a company for me where we liked their philosophy. We liked the owners of the company, and we like what they're trying to accomplish, and we like their integrity, and we like the fact that you can move your entire 401k into their company if you want to. This is all voluntary. It's all up to you. It's not something I'm trying to sell or push. You can buy your gold and silver from anybody you want. I don't care. But I suggest buying some, having something to hold of value, some equity, especially when you go into federal court to gain access to your trust. Take some in with you. I take in 40 pieces of silver. There's a reason for that, isn't there? He recognized it right off when I said it. Saw its face, okay? There's a reason for that. It's important to have assets that are real. Real assets. I keep a lot of it, okay? I think it's incredibly important. And it's good trade value. And it's a good investment. So she brings 7K medals to the, to the company, to this organization of state nationals. And it's something that I believe is very important to all of us. She does a lot of other things, PMAs, land patents. She's working with some of the technology so that she can do that to, and help people in her area. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow. But uh, she's an incredible asset to have. I love her very much. All right. And you've already met Dr. Buzz. I've already talked about Rob and Neil. And, of course, Becky. It's kind of like a little right hand. Helps them out uh, dramatically. I just don't want to miss anybody. Amy, come on up for a minute. Come here. Now, Amy is not a person of a few words. I'm going to tell you a little story. I remember she called Bonnie and I about 11 o'clock one night after we just crawled into bed. And I literally put the phone on the pillow between Bonnie and I so we could both listen to Amy. I'm going to embarrass you a little bit. I love her to death. Anyway, Bonnie and I proceeded to fall asleep. We'd had a long, hard day. I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and Amy was still talking. Yes, I do love you. <laughs> I'll keep it short and sweet. Okay, now, now you get a little story. All right. Hi there, I'm so excited to see everyone, and I'm so excited to bring uh, the Sprint for Humanity van to David's event. We are literally rolling in from being in Vegas uh, for a few days and then driving through, so excuse us being a little bit tardy. We also had a little incident with diesel getting splashed all over me, which that's one of my biggest fears, but I just lived through it, so I'm not fearful of that anymore, thank you, God. But... um. I bring to the table um, a little bit of a different perspective. I have a um, frequency bed. Everybody knows that our whole entire thing is frequency, vibration, and energy. Are we all on the same page with that? Do we all agree that our body has the innate ability to heal itself as long as we give it what it needs to do to do that? Well, that's what the bed provides. It provides resident frequency for pretty much all the things that our body is composed of and it gets us kind of back online so that our body can do what it needs to do to help um, restore itself. Um, it's pretty magical. It's pretty amazing. I had originally had it um, at a secure location and seeing just a few people and when a woman would come out and say, oh my gosh, I was molested at the age of five to the age of um, 16 and she literally remote you know, released all that emotional trauma 
uh, when I had a man walk in with the walker and then walk out carrying the walker. Um, when I had a gentleman um, cancel his shoulder surgery because he no longer had the pain in the surgery. I knew, yeah, and the lady that had the stroke that literally the caregiver was, um, she was on the bed for the first time, the caregiver and um, the daughter and myself went to eat and then we we're gonna come back and give her a second treatment and the caregiver came back from the restroom with her eyes about this big and said she just pulled herself up and handed me toilet paper. And I was like, oh, wow. Um, so there's just been amazing things that have happened once you give your body the frequencies that it needs. And that's what the bed provides. I'm literally just a button pusher. I don't assess, I don't diagnose, I don't treat, I don't do anything. I just allow you to have the experience um, that you go out and ground and you set your intentions because God created the earth with his spoken word. And so you're gonna create your intentions with your spoken word while you're grounding. And then literally I just open up the door, put you uh, laying on the bed, and then literally you speak into existence um, The to allow God to enter the presence into your new quantum field. And then the rest is done by you and by God and by what your intentions are. And so um, it's super amazing. I've been very blessed. Um, today is going to be the first time um, when I had wanted to get this out to more people. I couldn't really figure out how to accomplish that. Um, but all I knew is that God put it on my heart that like, Amy, you're not going to be able to get to touch as many lives if you just stay right here. You need to get this. He gave me a sprinter, like, um, in my mind, because I wanted it to be called the Sprint for Humanity. And um, so I said, I want a Mercedes Sprinter to take this around. And um, I had found one. And uh, some people were coming to my house that arrived four hours earlier from Alabama. So I don't know what that was all about, except for God made a way for me to put that one on pause. I went to an art event with Katie and um, literally I'm talking to a tall uh, redhead and I'm just kind of telling her my story and what I wanted and what I had. And this gentleman kept walking over and looking at me and then he would walk away and then he would come over and look at me and walk away and he said so you need a sprinter and I said yeah and he goes I have one in my driveway that I'm trying to figure out what to do with it and it's yours I was like is he drunk and um <laughs> and um we texted the next day, we exchanged numbers and we texted the next day and I, I did give him kind of an out. Um, and uh, he said, no, it's yours, come pick it up. And so today is the first day that he's gonna get to witness what a weekend looks like of helping people every 30 minutes. Um, just see their faces as they get off. Um, he's been with me in Vegas and he got to witness it as well, but that was a select few. And this is gonna be every 30 minutes, someone gets off the bed with just a different perspective of life. And um, I'm excited that he's with me today and his name is Rich and he's right there. I got to see this technology when the U.S. Navy had it on their comfort ship in New York, 2019. And when President Trump, right before he left office, he released all the patents so that companies could start producing. And various companies jumped in and and because uh, the Navy owned and controlled most of that. And companies jumped in and started producing. And they all have, of course, different prices and quality levels and different things that they do. And everybody is, all these different companies are producing. And there's very few 
that have, that are accessible to the people. And the key, if it's, if it's not accessible, well, then it doesn't help very many. And so we're trying to, to get these things to you as you need them. And, uh, it's really incredible stuff. My, uh, my wife Bonnie has owned a company called MedSurge in Texas for a while with hyperbaric oxygen treatment, foot, foot baths, foot spas, various things that help heal you, herbs, uh, a lot of different things that help heal the body. But adding these technologies is just to increase that a, a lot. And, uh, it's so important for all of us. And I know this isn't what you came here to learn, but these are things that keep us going. It's just going to help save the world, really, and save our health because one of the most, in fact, President Trump calls it the most evil organization in the world is the AMA. The most evil organization in the world is the AMA. Your doctor, you were, they spent billions of dollars back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s to advertise to you to trust your doctor, trust your pharmacist. All while they poisoned you and killed you along the way slowly. Now, how many doctors in the room with the AMA? We have any other than Paul? Few uh, that used to be. That's too bad. We don't seem to attract the evil that much. We can't get any attorneys here. Can't get any doctors here. God only warned us about four professions in the Bible. Who did He warn us about? Bankers. Teachers of law. Doctors and pastors organize religion. What is the definition of the word pastor? Do you guys know? Look up the word Satan's helper. He warned us about organized religion. Jesus Christ, the most powerful and kind and most perfect man that ever walked the face of the earth, got violent. Do you know that? When he saw the money changers in the temple, he left. And he went out and he made whips. And he went back in the temple, and he turned over their tables, and he whipped them out the door. I didn't see him turning the other cheek on that one. There's going to come a day where we're going to have to do that again and fall in his footsteps. And it's coming fast. Everybody knows in this room, right, that the United States government is a corporation. Okay? Incredibly important to know. So, what is it? Title 28 of the United States Code, Section 3025, Chapter 176. It states, our federal government is a corporation. When God says to come out of her, O ye Babylon, what does he mean? What does he mean? Babylon was the first incorporated city in the world. It means to come out of the corporate construct. 
Because what is a corporation? What is it? It's a dead entity. It's a corpse oration. Understand that, it is. It is a dead entity, it's a corpse. When they put out a war rant on you, it's a declaration of war. A warranty is a declaration of war that you accept. When they put out a warrant, it's a corpious warrant. Do you know what that means? It means to seize the corpse. To seize the corpse. You did it to yourself. You know how you did it to yourself, do you? Okay. You gave up your rights by being a citizen, person, resident, debtor. I can keep going. What's that mean? City is municipal servant. What's a public servant? A municipal servant. You took on that position voluntarily. Person. Here, let me spell it a little different. The root word of person is purser. What is a purser? It's somebody who holds office on a ship. What is your body considered when you registered it, registered it at birth? A vessel. Look in the rules, uh, Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. Calls you a vessel. A ship. A shipping company. Holding the office of purser aboard the ship. Look up purser in Wikipedia. I don't care. Any dictionary. Wikipedia actually explains it quite well. It says uh, the office holder of the ship that's responsible for the taxes, port charges, fees, replenishing the supplies of the ship. See? That's his job. He's the guy that holds the purse. Therefore, he can be held in debtor's prison. All prisons and all people in prisons are held as the debtor and the decedent. All prisons are debtor's prisons. And our laws say there's not supposed to be any debtor's prisons. Look up the word resident. Someone there temporarily to do business. By living in, remember my cute little map I drew with all the districts? By living in use of your zip code, it puts you in a federal district just because you use your zip code. That's why the federal government can come into the state of Florida and arrest you. And you're tried maybe down there in Miami, the court that President Trump went to, which is a big ship at four docks with the lawn as a, a waves. Look at it from Google Earth, guys. It's a ship. All federal courthouses are ships. The old 9th District Courthouse in downtown Portland, a big square building that takes up an entire city block. You walk in the door. The, what you're seeing on the outside is just the dock. You walk in the door, and it's a curved wooden wall that goes up. It's a sh wooden ship inside that building at Dry Dock, and it was built over 100 years ago. It was built in 1865. 
showing that they're admiralty courts, the ships at the docks. These are our federal courthouses in our districts. That's the ninth district in Portland, Oregon. California and Oregon are ninth district courts. So to be a resident using your zip code means you live in Washington, D.C., and you reside in Florida temporarily to do business, and you live on residential home, that's your place of business. And it's a commercial term, and they termed it commercial. So no matter if you got a residential, industrial, or commercial property, you have a commercial property. They wanted to lead you to believe that you didn't, but you do. Because they can only regulate commerce. Government can only regulate commerce. They can't regulate your private business affairs and your private lives. Is that an E or is that an A? I think that's an A. Decedent. All your bank accounts are decedent accounts. You've got to understand the English language. You've got to break it down. One of the smartest people I know is an American state national in this entire movement. Lives up in the Northeast. And he looks up every word every word on Google Translator, so I'm not a fan of Google, but he looks them up in English, Latin, and Hebrew. English, Latin, and Hebrew. And that's the only way he figures out the true meaning of the word. He has to see its definitions in all three of these languages and go to the root and then he sees a real English language, and the man has a doctorate degree from Oxford University. He's very brilliant. And he writes some of the most perfect legal documents I've ever seen. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. But, but, but this is what he does. Types in the word, and he looks it up. I recommend we learn the English language because they sure did not teach you in school. They didn't teach, teach you anything about styles either. Like if you've got a legal document and you draw a line from margin to margin, do you know what you just did? You created a new page. So if you page it down here, page 1 of 17, the judge will look at it like this and go, and he'll only count something with the page number. Oh. Why do legal documents that attorneys write have lines and boxes all over them? So they can take it out of a contract. If you've got something in a box, it is not part of the contract. It's called the four corner rule. You want to take your zip code out of the contract? Write your zip code. And put, a box, put corners around it. You want to fix your real estate contracts white out the borders around the edge of the contract and add a little silver to it and watch what it does. That was a little helpful hint there. Bonnie sold a $7 million home, whited out the, the corners, added silver to it. 
acquired all the furniture in the house by silver. And that $7 million home, the county lost about 80000 a year in property taxes. Private contracts between the buyer and the seller. You're removing the four corner rule. No, not yet. Maybe tomorrow. Don't don't jump ahead. All right. <clears throat> Let me tell you something. We just recently had a court case where the gentleman that was involved, the, who had studied under me, had brought up the SESTA QV trust in the courtroom. And everybody got quiet in the courtroom, and the judge looked right at him and told him there's no such thing. Now, this is a beautiful thing for us when they do that, because I can't deny it. So... This is understanding the Sussex QV Trust Act of 1666. Now, this is a document that is in my book that you can buy. It's called, well, before I tell you what it's called, the source is the Columbia Law Review. Volume 17, number 4. April of 1917. Now understand, the banking had been in business at that time for four years, right? 1913, 1917. On pages 269 and 290 was the source. This was published by the Columbia Law Review Association, Incorporated. The author was Austin Wakeman Scott. He's an interesting character. He was uh, an alumni, a college professor of the law school. He was a student there, had graduated there. And uh, he wrote this paper called The Nature of the Rights of the Sesta Q Trust. Now, when a judge says, oh, that doesn't exist, you say, oh, so Columbia Law Review was wrong? The law school was wrong? Because the law school has published many articles on the SESTA QV Trust. This is just one of them. And it's a document that explains the trust pretty well. Okay? The, there's reasons why all of our Everything that I teach you is backed up in writing. It's out there. I would not have survived in this country for 35 years putting on seminars. And by the way, I have put on seminars in Scotland, Ireland, England, Italy, Spain, Australia, New Zealand, all across Canada, and South America. And the seminar I put on in Keene, Texas with 364 people in the room, there was another 150 or so on Zoom. We had a man in the room who was from Peru and his brother is a preacher in Peru. And his brother signed up for the Zoom through Rob and he Put that through translation, and an entire three-day seminar was shown in churches in five countries in South America to more than 10,000 people for three days. Let me tell you something. This is why it's getting all over the world. Germany did a documentary 
showed it on their largest television station, interviewed me. This was about a year and a half ago. And it was entitled, The Critical Difference the American State National Movement Has Had on Germany and Eastern Europe. And that was the title of the documentary. The Critical Difference the American State National Movement Has Had on Germany and Eastern Europe. I gotta tell you right now, I'm very excited. There are a whole bunch of documentaries coming out over this summer, and we're making more now. That are all about what I'm teaching. And there, some of them are being shown on TV and in movie theaters across the country. Go ahead. Any United Nations nation is being treated the same way. Every United Nations nation followed England with the SESTA QV Trust and how we are all treated as human trafficked persons under a bond system that funds the world. And it all starts with the story of a mother. About six, five, I don't even remember how long ago. It's gotta be six or seven years ago now. I got it in the opportunity to speak at The Hague. And I told the story of a mother. And after that was all over, world leaders were coming up and shaking my hand and saying that this is the most important story that could be taught worldwide, but we don't want you to teach it. And they didn't want me to say anymore and teach it anymore. Don't tell David Strait not to teach something that's important because I'm gonna do it twice as much. And that's exactly what I did. So I'm going to quickly tell you the story of a mother because it's so important. Who has had in this room either themselves, their spouse, or a family member, or a close friend who's had a problem with Child Protective Services nationwide? Raise your hands. You see the number of hands, guys? In Maricopa County, Arizona, it's one out of every four homes. That's just one county. One out of four. 2,148 children a day are taken from their parents in this country. 800,000 a year. Every child's worth $3.3 million to them. I know, because my dad used to say, if you want to figure something out, follow the money. $3.3 million. And that doesn't include the child support. What do I mean by that? Well, let me use Texas as an example. Texas is the second highest paid state by the federal government if they can force someone to pay child support. California's first, Texas is second, New York is third, and Florida is fourth. So let me give you an example. If you're a young father and you go through a divorce, or if they just take your kids and force your family to separate, and you have to pay child support, and the state can make you pay $1,000 in child support each month, in the state of Texas, they get $12.29 from the federal government for every dollar they collect. So the state of Texas gets $12,290 in federal funds out of Title IV of Social Security for forcing one young father to pay a thousand a month of child support. So why do you think the state comes after him so hard? 
That's direct federal funding from the federal government to the state. That has nothing to do with the fact that they split up a family. It has nothing to do with the fact that they took one child. Maybe they took four. But one child, they take one and a half million dollars out of the mother's Sesta QV trust. They take one and a half million dollars out of the father's Sesta QV trust. That's three million. And they get an additional 300,000 over 18 months from the federal government. And that doesn't include the child support. So when I say every child is worth 3.3 million, I mean it because I proved it. Parents, you hold on to your children's hand and anybody that comes for them, you don't allow them to take them. I don't care what it takes. The stats I'm actually giving you are a few years old. It's gotten worse. Hell, it ain't easy. It is not easy. But there's organizations that put it out. You just got to search. I'm using numbers that are several years old. I get so pissed off all the time and I'm so busy. I can't spend the time to relook that crap up a year after year after year. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Article 9 of the Articles of Confederation. I mentioned this earlier. Article 9 says Canada acceding to this confederation and joining in the measures of the United States shall be admitted into and entitled to all the advantages of this union. But no other colony shall be admitted into the same unless such admission is to be agreed upon by at least nine states. So right there in the Articles of Confederation, Canada is part of the United States. Don't let them tell you any differently. Now, the story of a mother. Between 1905 and 1935, a whole bunch of acts of Congress was put into place to create this system of fraud. And that's just in the United States. Other countries did it much sooner. England did it in 1666, and other countries in Europe adopted it right after England, some of them, over the next 100 years, most of them. But we didn't adopt it until 1933. But between 1905 and 1935, during those three decades, is when most of these laws were passed in the United States. And one of the first ones was called the Child Act. And in the Child Act, they designated all hospitals, later adding police stations and fire stations, but they designated all hospitals and churches as foundling, foundling. Very important word. In foundling. What does foundling mean? It means a safe place to abandon a child. So a mother, nine months pregnant, walks into a foundling hospital. They all are. And she's about to give birth to a beautiful baby. 
and she goes into a birthing ward where she becomes a ward of the state. Anything with the word ward after it tells you she becomes a ward of the state. So she goes into this birthing ward and she goes through a major medical procedure called childbirth where she's in pain under duress, stress, and pain, and she delivers a baby. And the baby comes out of the water, is tugged through the birth canal, is docked at the dock by the dock tender, Doc Tendor. No physician delivers a baby, only doctors do. That's where the term doctor came from. The Doc Tender, who delivers that vessel. And through satanic symbolism of the American Medical Association and other associations all over the world, they take the baby's soul. I don't know if I can draw it well. And they take the baby's footprints as symbolism for taking its soul. Then they take the placenta and they pinch it off very quickly and one third of the baby's blood is in the placenta and it's supposed to drain back to the baby over a period of about 20 to 25 minutes until it's completely empty. And the reason they pinch it off ahead of time is to remove the baby's blood, take its blood. And a lot of times, babies die or get jaundice or a variety of other things because it doesn't have enough blood in its body. The blood has been fed through the placenta from the mother. And when that placenta detaches, the baby's blood's in it. And babies wouldn't get jaundice if they had that blood back in them. Okay? So they take the placenta, which is symbolism for taking its blood, its life. And then the baby is sent with the tug, that's the mom, that's her vessel, out to sea where it's presumed dead and lost at sea until it should return after its seventh year and claim its minor estate after its seventh year. Why after its seventh year? What is that? The eighth birthday. What does the eighth birthday signify? It's infinity. It's the age of accountability. From that point on, it's the infinity symbol. Symbolism's important. That's the age of accountability. See, the legal definition of the word minor is somebody over the age of 18 or someone of any age who hasn't claimed their minor estate. So I don't care if you're 99 years old. If you haven't claimed your minor estate, you're still a minor. And this is why you must be represented in court. This is why they force you to have an attorney in canon law. You know why Bonnie's in jail right now? Because they put an attorney on her list. She mailed him a letter firing him for cause of fraud and swindle and the ineffective assistance of counsel and fired him and it never got delivered to him until right before the date of her trial. And he showed up at trial, and he walked in, walked right past me, walked up to the prosecutor's table, pulled a piece of paper, signed it, walked past where Bonnie's supposed to sit, and she wasn't even brought in yet from the jail. And he sat down at the end of the table against the wall right by her. And she walked in, and the trial started. She fired him, told him to get out, and he left and went out. And he walked out with a great big old smile on his face. 
And the reason he had a smile on his face is because he already got paid by signing that paper. And it takes three signatures to put somebody in prison. It takes the judges, the prosecutors, and you or your power of attorney. And the court had assigned him as the attorney and ignored her firing him until it was too late. And so they had three signatures with him acting as power of attorney. And if you pull up her county records right now, it lists that son of a bitch, Mr. Luttrell. I'm coming. As her attorney. And Bonnie's never needed an attorney in her life. In fact, she eats attorneys and judges for breakfast. But that's one of the reasons she's there right now. Absolutely. In fact, you look up who can an attorney represent. What does it say? It says they can represent a corporation or an entity. That they can represent a minor. That they can represent somebody incompetent or somebody infirmed. That's it. That's all they can represent. So if you've got an attorney and he's forced upon you, they're deeming you a minor. They deem Bonnie indigent. Let me tell you something. We own several million dollars worth of property free and clear. I've got at least half a million in gold and silver, several hundred thousand dollars in cash, at least that much in value in firearms. Did I say that? Did you catch it? Did you see why I said it? I don't own any firearms. None. Zero. That's right. I own lots of arms. I don't own any firearms. Uh, see, that's shit made up. That's the reason people like own this building have to have a FFL license. It's because they sell firearms. They don't know t to sell arms. Exactly. You can't take an English language and redefine a word to make it illegal. That's shit made up. By who? Man. They weren't the creator. We never gave them any creative ability. And that's how you have to fight it. You have to fight it on the fact we didn't give them creative ability. See? Okay. The judge... The prosecutor, that's number one and number two. Number three is you or your power, somebody you gave power of attorney to, because they're the same as you. See? All right. Yes? He already did it before the court even started. He came in and signed it. She fired him by letter. Doesn't matter. I'm just telling you some of the reasons that she's there and not out already. Mainly because this whole thing started back when she was a good citizen. And she had hired an attorney. And then she filed some documents accepting everything and then tried to unaccept it. There's all kinds of reasons to it. She never committed a crime in the first place. An arm is not regulated. Okay. There was, they, they didn't show any intent to commit a crime. And intent has to be proven. I could have got her out of that case in the first... 10 minutes. Had I known her back in 2015, it would have been easy. 
It happened in October. I would have had her out by November 1st back then. But now so many problems have happened, it's hard to unwind a clock. And there was a reason God let it happen. I'm telling you now because I already know and I've already been shown it. So. Huh? Oh, it's very scary. It's very scary. But I know why they picked us. Because we're the two most competent people in the country to solve the issue that's going to be nationwide and worldwide. Nobody else can do this. Exactly. Oh, if you know what to look for, you're going to see it everywhere. If you don't know what to look for, you won't see any of it. And that's the thing. I see it everywhere I go when I'm dealing with these people. I see it in everything. Everything is written. Study corpus juris secundum. Study canon law. I mean, start studying the rules they're supposed to go by. Start studying the CFR. Right now, I'm going to tell you something in this country. They're doing stuff they would never have done even five years ago. They have gone rogue beyond your wildest imagination. The judges are looking at people right now and saying, we don't care. We will do what we want. We don't even follow our own rules anymore. We don't follow our own statutes. We don't follow our own codes. We don't follow the Constitution. We're not going to listen to you in the Bible. It's about Bible verses, which is the law of the United States. They are doing whatever the hell it is they want to do. And justice is dead in this country. And, I, and it happened about five years ago. There was a, some decisions that were made that started this. Yes, it started long before that in little minor amounts, but that's when it, that's when they closed the book, said we don't have to write no more. It's decided. Now we can do with the American people what we want to do. And they're terrorizing all of us. Now that it's gotten that bad, how do we win? We're working on that right now. We have a plan. Thirty million people have jumped off the citizenship in this country. How many people in here have not submitted your AORs? Get it done. This is a nice first class. First opportunity to start learning this. Wait till you're more advanced and you'll see how important it is what you're learning today. But you don't even recognize it at this stage. Yeah. They are. And the way to win is don't have to know black law or any of that. It might help you since that's not important. What is important is figuring out how to get the judge to act in his own self interest. Yeah. If you want a recent case uh, by giving the, the judge three possible scenarios, you have to choose one of the three. I don't remember exactly how to get it, but. Uh, yeah. yeah, easier said than done. If you don't know it, it's hard to know the mechanics. There's all kinds of things we could do to get Bonnie out of prison. She knows why she's there if they don't kill her first. And understand, they're trying to. And there's no doubt in my mind that they are, because they're proving it daily. They're making her situation worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. 
But what we're doing is so important to show that there is no justice left in this nation. I want you all to read Isaiah 59, the whole chapter. Okay? The whole chapter. Tells you exactly what happens and what's happening and what's about to happen. Um, where was I? Yeah, it's pretty much, pretty much done right there. Because you can keep it short and sweet, and you can use it to spread the word. The story of the mother is so critically important to spread the word with. And it's a way to get people interested. See, most people, most of us have a problem. We throw up all over everybody. We meet, we meet our neighbors and our friends and our family, and we just go start bouting off this, you know, David Strait shit. And, and you scare the hell out of them, and you sound like a conspiracy theorist, and on and on and on, and it's not. It's backed up by truth and fact. It's backed up by codes and statutes. It's backed up by our Constitution, by our history, by the Bible. It's all there. It's all there. One of the places that I found, something I found three decades ago that helped solidify this whole thing for me because I started out just helping moms and dads with kids who had problems with CPS. That's how I got started. Well, how did I get started? Because I took my kids. I was a businessman. I owned my own home. I owned five rental houses at the time. I would served this nation. I would guarded the presidents. And I came home, and I started and sold my old business, started a brand new one, hired babysitters to watch my kids because my wife left while me and the kids were at church. And she left. And about six months later, my son got in the garage, spilled gasoline on himself. The babysitter took him and ran him to the hospital, not knowing if he drank any or not. And by the time I got home, saw the note, ran to the hospital, they were loading my kids in a van on a Friday night. And a mentor who the sheriff gave me his business card said, here, call this guy. I'm, I'm giving you the short version. A mentor who was a friend of mine up until he died two years ago had been a federal prosecutor for 23 years, and he retired so he could start helping the people because he knew the fraud of our justice system. And he mentored me, and I got my kids back the very next Monday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. But here I was, a businessman with over 100 employees, owning my own home, owned my own cars, owned rental houses, was an upstanding member of society, had served my country, and they came in and took my kids away from me, a single dad whose only true under heaven responsibility was to protect his children, and believe me, I would have died for him. I thought to myself, well, if they could take them from me, who else are they taking them from? So I ran an ad in the newspaper, put in a special line at my office, had my secretary answer the phone calls when somebody called in on that line, and ran an ad that any parents having problems with CPS call this number. And we set up meetings at the library on Saturday. And I started teaching those parents on Saturday what to do. And I started out with very little knowledge other than what my mentor taught me. And it worked for me. So I started helping them. 
And I don't know if you saw that little snippet of a video that my wife took on her anniversary while I'm driving down the road in a car. She cornered me because I'm behind the wheel. But I had just done a seminar in Alabama. And a lady and her husband came up to me after the seminar. And the lady had been very skeptical about the state national movement. The husband had been trying to get her into it for months. And she heard me speak, and she remembered when she was a child living with her father in Oregon and how this guy helped her dad maintain custody of the kids without letting CPS get them and how he met her in a library 30 years before. And that was me. 30 years ago, I helped her when she was nine. Stay with her parents. That was a hard story for me to tell. First three or four times, Bonnie tried to corner me to tell that story. I couldn't do it. I'd start bawling. And it's still hard for me. This is like my second time telling it. It's still hard. But one of the things I found 30 years ago that helped solidify this whole thing for me was a story about a man named Edward Mandel House. How many people do not know who he is? Raise your hands. That's quite a few. Well, let me tell you about Edward Mandel House. Colonel Edward Mandel House. Colonel is an honorary title, by the way, even in the military. It's an honorary title. It's bestowed upon someone. Edward Mandel House never worked for government, not one single day in his life. He was a Texas oilman and a billionaire, and he had the ear of the bankers, and he had the ear of presidents, especially President Woodrow Wilson who was president of the United States when all the banking things happened at the time. And I'm going to read you this. This is the excerpts from a speech that he gave to Woodrow Wilson in the Oval Office that was recorded and written down. And by the way, everything that happens in the Oval Office is recorded and written down. And most of it's classified. But over time, it's not. This is the first real evidence found that our current social, financial, legal system was deliberately designed to enslave humanity. Okay? In a private meeting with Woodrow Wilson, who was president from 1913 to 1921, Colonel Edward Mandel House predicted the banksters' plans to enslave the American people, and he stated this, predicted it, my ass. He was a big part of it, okay? Very soon, every American will be required to register their biological property. That's you and your children, okay? In a national system designed to keep track of the people, that will operate under the ancient system of pledging. By such methodology, we can compel people to submit to our agenda, which will affect our security as a chargeback for our fiat paper currency. Every American will be forced to register or suffer being able to work and earn a living. They will be our chattel, our property, and we will hold the security interest over them forever. By operation of the law merchant, under the scheme of secured transactions, Americans, by unknowingly or unwittingly, delivering the bills of lading. What is a bill of lading? That's right, it's a birth certificate. It's a registered act of the birth certificate. See, I was born a living person. On 4-20-1963, on May the 3rd, 1963, 
my vessel was flagged and registered and given a flag. Do you know most ships in the world are registered under Panama because they have better shipping laws? And most shipping companies register under Panama. Even American ships, shipping companies, a lot of times register their vessel in Panama. Given a flag, registered the vessel, the birth certificate. Those bills relating to us will be rendered bankrupt and insolvent, secured by their pledges. Look at Bonnie, declared the indigent. Who decided that? It's in her court document. I don't think it was ever even talked about in her court case. The judge just wrote it down. I got more gold and silver in my safe than he owns. I guarantee it. I got more money in my bank account than he makes or that he owns. I guarantee it. I probably own more real estate than he owns. I guarantee that too. And he's saying my wife is indigent when her and I are one. We're about to have this argument and we'll see who wins. They will be stripped of their rights and given a commercial value designed to make us a profit and they will be none the wiser. For not one man in a million could ever figure our plans. And if by accident one or two should figure it out, we have in our arsenal plausible deniability. After all, this is the only logical way to fund government by floating liens and debts to the registrants in the form of benefits and privileges. Don't they call you all the time and offer you benefits? Tell you driving's a privilege? They took away your right to travel? Made you get a driver's license by your own consent and agreement? And then told you it was a privilege to drive? It's not only fraud, it's shit made up. See, there's three court cases in the state of Texas. Callis versus State, which is a Texas Court of Criminal Appeals case. There's, there's uh, Brooks versus State, which is a Texas Supreme Court case. And there's Hassel versus State, which is a county court case. And all three cases say exactly the same thing. You ready? There is no such thing known to Texas law as a driver's license. Three judges in three different courts, including the Supreme Court of the state of Texas in Brooks versus State, said there's no such thing known to Texas law as a driver's license. 502.003 of the Texas Transportation Code says no municipality can license a vehicle and charge a fee thereof unless it's operating in a commercial capacity. What is a commercial capacity? Hauling passengers for hire. Got to be an Uber driver, a Lyft driver, a taxi driver, or a bus driver. A public servant in the performance of their public duties. Let's see. Well, that's nobody anymore because even firemen are private for-profit corporations and police officers are private for-profit corporations. And there is no public servants. They're not. That took me a long time to learn and figure out and accept. Took me a long time. What's the other one? Somebody hauling goods or services for interstate commerce. It's the only three things that can be licensed. And the U.S. Department of Transportation says that same thing. Not only do they say it, but they put out a little thing called police visor cards. This book over here, by the way, is these uh, symbols. 
And right here, you can take a picture of that. It'll take you to the U.S. Department of Transportation's website, and you can look at a police visor card. Police visor cards are designed for the police officers to print off, laminate, put up on their visor so they know what a commercial vehicle looks like. Because your Toyota Camry and your Mercedes aren't on there. Neither is my Chevy Silverado. It's not on there. U.S. Department of Transportation doesn't give them the authority to stop your car, your automobile. What do you think they call it a police cruiser? Because that's a cruise ship. Why does it have blue lights on it? Why did they change from red lights to blue lights? Because they left the jurisdiction of the land where they were operating in common law and they moved into the water into admiralty law. And that's why they have the blue lights. It shows that they're operating in admiralty. Ask a police officer, did you know your car was called a cruiser? He said, sure. Do you know what that means? No. It means it's a land yacht and you're a pirate. In fact, you're a pirate that has fallen the direction of someone, usually a county attorney or the attorneys come in and tra train my police department that I used to be with. The county attorney would come in and train us. 114 officer, deputy sheriffs in the room. And he'd tell us, you know, don't stop anybody on this road, but make sure you keep them slow on the judge's road where his house is. Yeah. And they would direct us to do that. They say we're going we need this many tickets written to pay your salary. <laughs> and if you don't write enough, well then we're going to demote you and put you in the jail. You can be a jail guard with the sheriff's department. I don't know if you're with the county or what, but if you're with the county, that's what you do because the county sheriff's departments are responsible for the jails in the county. And they'll just demote you if you're not writing enough tickets. They'll take your car away, your privilege to drive that automobile. No. <laughs> and they'll take it away. You got to understand what this all means. This will inevitably reap us huge profits beyond our wildest expectations that leave every American a contributor to this fraud, which we will call social insurance, without realizing that every American will unknowingly be our servant. However begrudgingly, the people will become helpless and without any hope for their redemption, and we will employ the high office of the presidency of our dummy corporation to foment this plot against America. I think that's pretty clear. I think it's the most clear writing and statement that I've ever seen. Now, I'm going to read you a court case. Wheeling Steel Corporation versus Fox. 298 U.S. 19380LED 114356SCT, which means the Supreme Court, 773. That's a citation. Okay? It states this. Therefore, the U.S. citizens are citizens of the District of Columbia, residing in one of the states of the Union, are classified as property in franchises of the federal government as an individual entity. Did you know that? <laughs> sure. I'll... The citation? Wheeling Steel Corporation versus Fox. 298 U.S. That means a, it's a federal case. 19380 L period ED 1143 comma 
five six S period C T, that means Supreme Court, seven seven three. You guys all ought to take a little uh, little mini class online on how to read citations and what they mean. Because it will tell you whether they're a state case, a federal case, a Supreme Court case, a state federal, a state Supreme Court case, or whatever. Hey, David, let's take a 15-minute break. Okay.